For a pediatric case of a diabetes follow-up or new onset polydipsia or polyuria, using our mnemonic old cards will note the onset, or when was your child first diagnosed, or for polydipsia polyuria, when did you first notice it? To characterize the diabetes, we'll use our technique of pre, present, and post as we'll see below. Or for polyuria, we'll use our mnemonic A, B, and C since it is a bodily fluid to write down for our patient note the amount if there's any blood in the urine and the color. For treatments for diabetes, we can ask now or later in our present column about their medications including their compliance or side effects. And for severity, we can ask now or later in the post column about any complications doing a thorough review of symptoms to ask about any neuropathy or retinopathy as we'll see below. In all pediatric patients, instead of a physical exam, we're going to use our mnemonic bitter to remind us to ask about the birth history, immunizations, developmental history, diet, education, and to reflect with the parent. For all cases, let's order a physical exam, CBC, serum electrolytes, serum glucose, A1C, insulin levels, islet cell antibodies, BUN and creatinine to rule out kidney disease, a urinalysis and urine culture to rule out a urinary tract infection, and 24-hour urine cortisol if we're concerned for hypercortalism. Both diabetes type 1 and diabetes type 2 will present with polydipsia and polyuria. The key high yield differentiating between the two would be weight loss in type 1 and a weight gain in type 2. In our pre-column, we'd like to note when was your child first diagnosed and with what type. And then what symptoms were they having at the time, including polydipsia, polyuria, and then a weight loss or a weight gain. And then the severity of the blood glucose level or A1C at the time. Presently, we'd like to know what symptoms they're still currently having, if any and if they're keeping a home blood glucose level or A1C log. Or if they're not, we'd also want to state that in our patient note to show we've asked. And then their medications, including their dose, if they're compliant and any side effects they may be having, and then their diet and exercise routine. In the post column is when we could list our differentials. So if we're concerned for hypoglycemic episodes, we'll see lightheadedness, sweating, and palpitations. For diabetic retinopathy, we'll have a visual loss. And in neuropathy, we'll see numbness and tingling. And a common challenge question for a diabetic case, especially in a young child, is, as we see below, the parent asking, why does my, parent, why does my son have diabetes and can he still have dessert? And we'd like to counsel and explain to the parent that diabetes type 1 is when the body mistakenly attacks cells which produce insulin. A lot of cases are spontaneous. Parents don't have to have, this is not your fault. He should be able to have dessert as long as he continues to take his insulin. And moving on to new onset polydipsia or polyuria, we can have both diabetes type 1 or diabetes type 2 as differentials, but we can also have a urinary tract infection. And we'll see polyuria and now dysuria or abdominal or flank pain. And this can be indicated if the child is pointing to their stomach or if their mom notices that they seem to be crying when they're going to the bathroom. And finally, we'd also like to rule out hypercortalism and note how we're keeping the differential broad and not simply Cushing's disease. And we'll see polydipsia or polyuria. And the pathology here is cortisol increase in gluconeogenesis and also insulin resistance. And we'll have more sugar floating in the blood resulting in a diuresis. We can also see weight gain and classically a central weight gain with a peripheral loss. And then in our review of symptoms, we can note skin and hair changes, including hirsutism and abdominal striae.